Welcome to the How to Quit Working Show. This is the only show that brings you awesome people just like you who got sick and tired of doing something they don't like and don't care about and have created an amazing life of freedom using what they know instead of just getting paid for what they do. And now, here's your host, the quit working guy, Jeff Steinman. Hello and welcome to the show. Today, my guest is Jonathan Taylor, and Jonathan is the co-creator of the Beginner Internet Podcast, a podcast that he has taken up into the top 30 of the internet marketing podcasts on iTunes, and that is quite a feat. Jonathan's going to tell us all how he did it today, and we're also going to take a look at how he took what many would consider a very negative event in your life, which is getting laid off from a job, and he turned that into something awesome and something that has given him some, just a, a, a much better life than he would have had otherwise. I am excited to have Jonathan on the show today because he's got so much great stuff to share with us. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Jeff, thanks for having me on today. John, I am so excited to have you here because you, you know, you and I, uh, I'm, I think we met at, a, at an event out in California. And, and the thing that I that I think is so cool about your story is it's very similar to mine. You were working in the corporate world before you started doing your own thing. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, it seems like in, in a lot of ways it doesn't seem like too long ago, but then it <laughs> then you think of the time. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> it, it drags does. when you're working a full time job. <laughs> Well, I just go back. I graduated um, from college back in 1999, all the way back in 99, okay. and um, got my uh, got my degree in, of all things, uh, a speech language pathology. I was going to be a speech language pathologist. I had all uh, my life all mapped out, and um, sure. I had a buddy that uh, uh, my freshman year in college talked me into. I was actually a marketing major. Uh, to start with in college, and I had a buddy, a friend, good friend of mine who was a speech language pathology major who said, man, you've got to switch majors. This is awesome. He said the, um, uh, the ratio of, guy, of girls to guys is like 90-10. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, th- I'm there. <laughs> so all the right reasons. All the right. Yeah, exactly. All the right reasons. So, um, and, you know, he, he started laying out the scenario of after college, you know, hey, you can get um, you know, you can get a job at about 60 K and, and at that time to me, that was like, uh, that was like yeah. six figure money, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's good money. <laughs> and so, you know, I was excited. So, you know, again, I've, I've switched for all the wrong reasons, went through and, uh, and finished out. But really, as I got through the end, my senior year and graduated, I realized that <clears throat> really to move forward in that field, I really need to move on and get a master's degree. And I got to tell you, I was burned out. I was ready to be done with college. I love the the social uh, environment of college, but I did not like the, um, I was not a good student. I mean, I was a typical average student. So yeah, I, um, I, I, I like to learn from life experience and get out there and, and, um, and, and I wanted to make some money. And, and by that time I had met my wife and okay. we were dating and I was ready to move on with life. So to make a long story short, I decided I was not going to go that path. I was not going to, um, pursue, uh, move forward and get, you know, go through another two years of graduate school. Okay. I was ready to get started at work. So I actually got a job working in, uh, my first job out of college. I worked as a, of all things, a probation counselor, and um, was working with um, the local uh, judicial, uh, I guess, juvenile court. And what we would do, what I would do is go in with uh, kids that were on juvenile, um, that were on probation, juvenile probation for whatever, uh, you know, whatever the case, you know, uh-huh. theft or anything like that. And I'd have to go in as a counselor and kind of make sure that they were following through with their probation. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did that for about a year and a half and it just was total burned out. It was mm-hmm. not a good fit for me. Uh, I was just emotionally drained and I was emotionally drained with dealing with kids inside of a system where it was just nothing was meant to fix. I mean, it was just, it was a repetitive, you'd see a lot of the same kids going back through, they get off probation, then they get right back on and Mm -hmm. do something stupid. And I realized, you know, no matter what kind of positive change I tried to, um, you know, I try to be on these kids. I see these kids like two hours a week and they go home and they go back to these environments where, uh, they're around, you know, 80 to 90% of the time where it's just nothing but negativity and Mm. and all of the bad things. And I, I realized, you know, I'm just, I'm fight, you know, this is ridiculous. You know, there's no, um, the system is just really, um, 
not not, not that great, you know. Yeah, sure. You know, so I, I just really was discouraged. And my wife at that time said, you know, you really should change gears. And about that time, I she really thought, you know, you really should go into sales. You know, you really got the personality mm. for sales and. And so I decided had, had you, to go. Had you ever considered sales before that? I had not. Okay. I really had not considered sales. Um, I know I wanted to work. I, you know, early on, I thought, man, my calling is to work with. Uh, I wanted to work with. I love working with kids mm-hmm. and doing stuff like that. I'd worked in college. I'd worked some after school programs and things like that, and some uh, some summer camps with kids. And I just, I, you know, I had that. I just loved being around them. They were energetic, and that was me. But. Yeah. Um, but I decided to do that. You know, I decided to take a personality profile test. One of these um, by my friend Dan Miller. At that time, I just heard about him uh, on the radio, and I heard about his Forty Eight Days uh, to the Work You Love program. And I realized, hmm, that sounds interesting. I'm going to um, I'm going to order his program and and go through the personality test and see exactly what um, you know what my personality profile is and really what I am geared towards moving towards because okay. I, I read is, you know, I, I read through the book, the material and understand, you know, really it's, you got to start with who you are, um, before you make a decision about what you want to do. So sure. sure enough, I went through the test and, <laughs> and just as my wife had, uh, had, had told me, you know, I was, I had the personality that was geared towards, uh, either starting a business or being out in sales, working with people. And, um, and so I made that decision that I was going to, um, I was going to try my hand in sales, and I put together a number of resumes, sent those out to uh, to companies. Um, I put together about 20, 20 resumes and cover letters, and just I, I did more or less kind of a, a direct mail type uh, approach. Okay. Just picked and selected a number of different companies that I thought I might want to work for, mm-hmm. and um, really uh, had a great response um, okay. from the uh, from that method of, of targeting, and ended up getting a job um, for a man for a a manufacturer in uh, a company that manufactured uh, fiberglass uh, application equipment, like um, spray. Uh, they would spray uh, fiberglass into molds and things like that. So, okay, that sounds uh, really, really exciting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was like working for you know. Yeah, it, to me, it was like what? <laughs> I have no idea what I'm, what, but but apparently they like me enough to uh, to give me a try and. Okay. Um, uh, it was working with a lot of boat manufacturers and things like that. Um, a lot of manufacturers that, uh, you know, anything that you can think of that was made out of uh, fiberglass or anything like that. It was um, mostly, uh, you know, middle, uh, medium size to large manufacturers that I was calling on. So I started doing that. I started traveling. Um, and uh, then about 2008, uh, I worked there for about five years, and I'll tell you <laughs> what was ironic was uh, in 2000, let's see, it was 2007, I had one of my biggest sales years ever. I mean, I was about okay. a, almost a million dollars in sales. I mean, I was just killing it. Wow. And um, and then the recession hit, mm. and so <laughs> um, I just happened to be one of those salespeople. I mean, our com- the, the company that I worked for had uh, a pretty large sales force and a national sales force, but, um, they had to, they had to make a, a, a really tough decision to scale back uh, mm-hmm. big time when the recession hit. And, uh, because I was one of the younger guys, mm-hmm. uh, obviously. And, um, you know, we, they had to trim. Um, I was probably in the second line of people oh, okay. <laughs> that they, uh, they let go, you know, and I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, and, and it started dawning on me that, uh, even if you're in sales, you know, which, you know, I would think that for, for many professions, that's got to be uh, one of the most recession proof, because if you get out there and you can sell and, and, and uh, you know, you can, you can yeah. uh, do well at it, you know, you, I mean, what company's going to let you go? But, yeah. but even in a tough situation, even in tough, uh, tough economy, companies still have to make decisions. And especially this company where they had uh, a pretty large sales force, um, you know, throughout the country, they had to make some serious cuts. Mm. And, um, and so even though that year before, that's just a lesson, even though that year before I had my biggest, uh, sales, um, sales numbers ever with the company that since I'd been there, I still was on the, uh, on the chop block. Mm. So, um, uh, that forced me into some serious, uh, you know, some serious thinking like, oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, you know, I guess I, so. 
yeah, exactly. You know, nothing is safe, you know, and yeah. I realized that, uh, and I really had gotten, you know, throughout this, throughout the time that I was in sales, I'd really changed a lot of my thinking, uh, just from listening and reading a lot of great stuff, le- reading the, um, uh, success principles, reading, uh, listening oh, to a lot of Zig Ziglar and, love and reading. Su- I love the success principles. That was, oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, listening to things like Napoleon Hill yeah. and, and, um, you know, listening to Brian Tracy and all of those, um, all of those guys. And I had really changed a lot of my thinking in terms of, uh, really thinking of myself in terms of me, Inc, you know, mm-hmm. me, Inc, mm-hmm. not, mm-hmm. not working for an Inc, even though mm-hmm. I was in sales, I thought of myself as being, uh, my own personal corporation that, you know, everything, uh, everything relied on what I do and get out there and do, you know, it's not, it's not about the company that, you know, even though I worked for a company, uh-huh. I still had to look and, and look at it in terms of, look, no matter what the company does, I have to be responsible for me. And, uh, See, and that was, and that's, that's a huge shift because at that point you're saying no longer does it have anything to do with the economy. No longer does it have anything to do with my education or right. my situation or anything like that. It's all about me and what I do. That's a huge shift yes. that you made there. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and so I realized, you know, I was already making the transition mentally during that time. Mm. And, um, uh, you know, during that time I realized, you know, I've got to have something, uh, no job really is safe and I really need to have something on the side. So actually one of the things that I started doing, um, in addition to sales during that time was doing uh, career coaching on the side. Oh, and okay. I was, um, started doing, uh, I became a facilitator for, um, the 48 days program, um, uh, that Dan cool. Miller uh, taught the actually the system that I went through that helped me change my career path. I uh, I was such a huge fan of it that I decided to um, be one of the coaches for that. So okay. I started working with clients locally in my spare time, and um, you know working with uh, individual clients that really were at a crossroads in their life that really were just trying to figure out what they wanted to do in their life. And this is why I was still in the sales job. Um, well, one of the things I realized though during that time is that, uh, what was frustrating to me in working with uh, individuals was that people wanted to talk about their past experiences mm-hmm. and all past issues that they've had, what's caused them not to, um, not to, you know, find their purpose or whatever. And, and really I got to the point where I started feeling like these people are talking to me like I'm a counselor I'm not a counselor. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm career coaching. I'm not career counseling. Yeah. Uh, and I was trying to, you know, redirect them towards the future, you know, what they wanted to do, sure. uh, you know, what they, you know, the game plan as far as mapping out what they, what the next step was. But I realized that so many people are just locked into the past. And, and uh, <clears throat> I realized that after one of my last, the last uh, coaching clients that I had where it was just, she was, uh, I, I still, it still stands out to me really, uh, <laughs> really well that she was just so locked into things in her past and, and that she could not make the change. And I finally, I came home, uh, after one coaching session or after one of my last coaching sessions and told my wife, I just, I really cannot work with individuals that have this kind of mentality. I'm such, mm-hmm. you know, my, my mentality, especially in being in sales at that time was like, mm-hmm. okay, let's figure out, let's work on a game plan. Yeah. And then I started, you know, I really started analyzing that I really enjoyed the coaching process. I really enjoyed the, um, you know, the, the count or the, uh, the consulting process of, or the teaching process. I enjoyed that. I just hated the part where people like think of me as a counselor. So, uh, I realized that wait, you know, maybe my focus needs to be on businesses instead of individuals as far as coaching. It it sounds like the thing that was really giving you pause was having to listen to everybody's excuses. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I just, I hate that. You know, I think it's, it's, it's so easy for people to make excuses and, you know, we all are guilty of that from time to time, but, uh, but you would work, I would, you know, I'd work with people who that was their primary focus and that's all you heard. And I realized that, you know, businesses, most people in business or most people that run a business or most entrepreneurs, they're not excuse makers. They want to figure out the issue. They want to figure out the bottom, you know, how to improve the bottom line and get to that. And Mm -hmm. that's what excites me. That's what I enjoyed. Yeah. And, um, and so I realized during that time when I was still in sales with this company that, 
uh, maybe what I could do is start doing some small business coaching on the side. And uh, that's what I started really studying the whole um, uh, marketing, sales and marketing are really just immerse myself. And I, I, I tell people like I get, m- I've gotten more education out of college mm-hmm. <laughs> um, than I have in four years in college yeah. because I really became a student of sales and marketing. And um, about the time that I had, um, uh, about the time that I had uh, gotten fired from my job or let go or, or downsize, whatever you want to call it back in 2008, I had started doing some consulting work, some, uh, some working with companies. And a lot of it was some of the companies that I had um, developed relationships in sales, you know, when I was in sales, some okay. of my top, um, top customers and clients. And I started helping them with their marketing. I started uh, talking to them about what they're doing with their online marketing, with some of their offline marketing and realized, man, this is really cool. I love doing this. Yeah. And um, so when I got laid off, I really had to analyze things and think, maybe this is an opportunity for re- me to really um, really to change directions and really think in terms of, uh, you know, relying on myself, I mean, completely and just saying, okay, you know, I am going to be completely me ink or you ink, however you want to put it. Um, you know, that's going to be, that's going to be me. So I launched uh, my personal or my uh, small business brand, which is brand new marketing. Um, okay. And started doing consulting for businesses. And about that time, I met um, a guy here locally um, who actually, we uh, started really doing kind of a meetup group here locally in Knoxville. Um, uh, One of these, uh, if you go to meetup.com, you can, uh, you know, set up one of these local meetups in your area. And so we decided to start a local meetup group in the Knoxville area. And this was back in 2008. And we started doing this once a month and really... Uh, where we were actually, he and I, he had his own um, digital marketing. He was doing digital marketing for small businesses. I was, I had started doing that and uh, we just hit it off. You know, we had, we would come to get, get together and we had a lot of great ideas together. And so we decided to start doing meetups uh, each month and we would um, do these for small businesses where we okay. would do workshops and things like that. And were they, were they free or did you charge the people to attend? We actually char- we charged a very nominal fee, but okay. it was basically just enough to cover the cost of uh, you know any cost of the room or anything like that. Okay. I think the the very first one we were charging probably like three or four dollars. I think okay. per person, and it was just enough to uh, to pay our monthly rent. Okay, um, and we still we, I mean this is five years later, and we still do those monthly meetup monthly marketing meetup groups today. We still do cool. them each month. Cool. And, well, um, and, and and that's the beginning of when you started to take – you and Russell got together and you started to yep. take the knowledge and information that you have and you started mm-hmm. to put it out into the community. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and then, you know, we were doing the meetups. We thought, wow, you know, we started to learn about podcasting and um, mm-hmm. it, we thought, hey, it, let's try this podcasting thing because we just – I mean, we're a couple of guys that – we love talking about this stuff, and, and I, I came up with the idea, well, maybe we could do like a Saturday morning radio show, you know, on the weekend, you know, yeah. on a Saturday morning, get up on a Saturday, and we decided to use this um, service called Blog Talk Radio, uh-huh. and I remember the first days, we were using nothing but our cell phones, we would call into the, uh, they'd give, you know, you set up an account with Blog Talk Radio, you'd call into a um, an 800 number, and then you could, uh, you could both get on the line together and you could occasionally have a guest that would come on the line. And okay. it was, uh, the audio quality was, a, was somewhat lacking, but it was, it was fun. You know, it was new yeah. to us and it was completely free, which was a, okay. a big attractive part. Yeah, of it. sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so we started doing that on a, on a weekly basis. And this was back in, uh, this was like back in January of 2009. So, okay. uh, we started out and I, I just remember the first the first three or four months, we had almost no one listening. I think maybe he and I were the uh-huh. only listeners and uh, whatever guest that we might have had on. But uh, and you're, you know, ap- somebody's mom was listening too. Right? So, yeah, I think <laughs> my mom and my, I know my wife was listening just to make me feel better. But, um, but yeah, and, and you know, we could have easily decided after about three or four months, hey, this is not working. Let's just let's do something else. Let's move on. Uh, but I said, you know, let's just keep, let's keep the momentum going and see what happens, you know, see if we can just, you know, just through consistency. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's such a huge part of my life now is, is the, um, the, the, the importance of being consistent in what you do. 
Um, but if we just keep doing this every week, come on, let's just keep knocking at it, keep wearing it down and, and see what happens. And, and so, uh, you know, about six months rolled around and we started seeing some, uh, we started seeing some success. We started getting in listeners. We started getting subscribers to our podcast and downloads. And, you know, it was just a process of, of sticking with it and staying with it. And, and after about two years, we stayed on blog talk radio for about two years. Okay. And uh, built up a uh, listenership of well over 70,000 listens to that show. Wow. And that was on just Blog Talk Radio. I wow. Mean, um, so about that time, we thought, man, this is great. You know, um, uh, you know and, but uh, where do we go from here? You know, what, what do we do from here with this? Because we've got this, uh, we've got this show on Blog Talk Radio, and it seems like it's growing. Um, but something that I started, you know, the more I learned about podcasting, the more I realized that if anything ever happened to Blog Talk Radio, we would completely lose all of the content and all of the podcast feed that we had yeah. ever done mm-hmm. over two year, a two-year period. Yeah. And um, so we, one of the guests that we had on, Cliff Ravenscraft, um, the podcast answer man, uh, I had talked to him and I'd... Uh, he had done some consulting with me and, you know, I, I picked his brain and he mm-hmm. said, you know, really, if you, uh, if you really want to grow your podcast, you really need to have your own, uh, feed and you need to have your own site dedicated to that podcast. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that got us thinking and, and, uh, you know, we decided, you know what, <clears throat> if we're going to continue to do this podcast and continue to grow, now's the time to, uh, go ahead and make the change. So um, we went out and, and uh, jumped on Libsyn, which is an audio hosting for our podcast, and, yeah. and, uh, and then decided to uh, set up our own website over at BIB Podcast and, and uh, started gradually moving a lot of the old episodes that we had done with Blog Talk Radio over. And um, I went out, I, I never will forget, I got uh, around this time, I, I was like, wow, I want to invest in some equipment. But uh, some of the equipment that I wanted to invest in, it was kind of high end. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I just happened about that time, uh, a company, I mean, this is crazy, the timing of this, that I got uh, a company up in Cincinnati uh, sent me an email. They were wanting to uh, purchase one of the, one of the uh, domains that I had. I had, oh, okay. I've got probably about 30 or 40 domains in GoDaddy. Oh, you're a and domain I, hoarder. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> And there they, needs to be a show about us. Yeah, I, yeah, right. I'm trying to recover. <laughs> I let yeah, a bunch I mean, expire this year because I was like, you know, you you got to get over this. <laughs> that's right. Because there's all you're all. Are you really going to do something with that domain that you got yeah. two years? Next, know? next, 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 I'm going to have like 15 <laughs> cats in the house, and it's just, it's not, it's not. I'm going to be on Discovery Network. You should start a show called Domain Hoarders. Yes. <laughs> But, but anyway, uh, yeah, but you know, I had this one great name. I remember it was called brand or it was called uh blackboard marketing. And I thought, man, okay. this is a really cool name. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to add this as part of a brand to my, um, uh, to my, uh, digital marketing services, my, you know, as a consultant, I'm, I was, I had this plan to create these, uh, screencast videos that were nothing but more or less like video scribes. Um, and they were, there were, you know, I, I would have like a blackboard in the background <laughs> and do all of this content. I was like, man, this is going to be cool, you know, but obviously I didn't get around to doing that. Yeah. There's only so much time in the day. And yeah. you, sometimes you, you, you really think, uh, you know, sometimes you're not grounded in reality. People. That yes. Are- <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, that's, that's the blessing and the curse of creative people. That's right. You know, and you get what I call idea Yep. You just can't <laughs> I love that. They don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> Idea real. That's awesome. Yeah, so I real so I had a company that contacted me and they said, you know, they offered me like five hundred dollars and I wouldn't take it. And then they offered me a thousand and I wouldn't take it. And then finally I said, Listen, if you really want this name, I'll give it to you for fifteen hundred bucks. So they uh they they said no and I, I said, Okay, fine, whatever. And uh about three days later, they contacted me back. <laughs> <laughs> they said, you know, we've reconsidered. We'll take it for 1500 So I let it. I, I sold it for 1500 took that money. You should have said, now it's $2,000. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a penalty fee now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I took that money and actually just went out and invested that into the extra money that I got from that. Invested it into the, uh, a, a really nice sound mixer, uh, a Heil PR40 mic. Um, just... All the equipment that I need to get started, yeah. I mean, completely covered it, and it was just awesome. You know, cool. it was just 
And so I use that to set it up and, uh, and set up, you know, with the digital recorders and everything. And so we started just going high end and uh, really have created a nice brand over there and it just continues to grow. And, and um, we're pretty excited the way things are going over there. And then uh, about that time, you know, I had uh, started Brand U Marketing and that was going well. Uh, and not too long ago, Russell and I, you know, we'd been, we were like, you know what, you're doing your thing on the side. You're, you're doing your digital marketing over here. I'm doing my marketing uh, consulting business. We've been doing a podcast for about five years. Uh-huh. I think we can, I think there's a certain level of trust now that we, you know, we work well together. So we decided to come together kind of like as a strategic under like a strategic partnership. And we formed uh, Buzz Mountain Media uh, and you can see it over at buzzmountain.com. And that is our we'll link that up a little bit. Yeah, that's our, our digital marketing and consulting business. And, uh, and so that's what we, uh, we, we do that on this. I mean, our big thing, you know, I'm a huge, I'm a huge proponent of multiple streams of income. And, um, my thing is, you know, we make, we make money from the podcast, um, uh, through affiliate advertising and, uh, we do, um, you know, we have our marketing business on the side and, and, uh, there's some other online businesses that, that we have, that we make money from. We've, uh, we're also involved in marketing for, um, for local veterinarians. And we've probably published a couple of books, uh, in that regard. And so, uh, you know, we, it's something that we enjoy doing. It's something that we're passionate about. And it, to me, each week getting on a podcast show and recording content each week and having guests is just easy stuff for us because it's just, it's part of what we do, and it's just fun. It's it's it is fun. A lot of fun. <laughs> it's fun doing what you love. I, and yeah. I tell you, there's not a day goes by that I don't. I'm, I'm not. Uh, it's easy for you know. It's you know. You look at most people in their in their nine to five jobs, and uh, you know I can work. I start. I started the day out today, getting up, walking into my office, which is in my home. After I made some coffee and, you know, firing up the computer and I look out the window and it's beautiful. It's like, it feels like fall weather outside. Uh-huh. I can raise the, uh, the window up to my office and you can feel the cool breeze coming in and it's just pleasant. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and just, and, you know, working out of your office, looking out, uh, looking outside, um, and I don't have to drive, you know, there's no commute for me. I don't have to drive into an office or anything like that. And it is so it is so fun. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's just fun to do what you love. Yeah. Well, you know, while we're talking about that, I mean, tell us a little bit about how does this this lifestyle that you've created in this business that you've created, how does it make your life better? Well, I tell you, it, to me, it offers me flexibility. Time is to me, as I get older, and and it's probably the same for you. As as we get old, you know, in our younger years, we value money. I mean, yeah. it's like. And I got to get that paycheck, you know, yeah. but as you get older, uh, one of the things you start to realize is, at least in my life, I start valuing time more than money because mm-hmm. I've made money and I continue. I mean, I make money now and, and I have, I support my family. I have a good, um, a, a great income. My, my wife, she doesn't have to work. And, and, uh, we've got two, um, we've got a nine year old and a seven year old. And, and so that gives us, I think, I think it gives me the freedom uh, and and the flexibility of time. T- money is a tool to yeah. me. Money is mm-hmm. nothing more than a tool that allows me and affords me uh, time that I need to um, to spend with my family and to do those things that you know the flexibility of being able to get up and go on a you know like occasionally we'll just say you know what let's go to um, you know we live over in. Uh, we live in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is right down the road is, is uh, Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg, oh, okay. and, uh, which is uh, Dollywood. You know, my kids love Dollywood. Oh, cool. So we'll just uh, occasionally, you know, we'll, we, we get season passes and we'll say, yeah, let's go take the kids to Dollywood uh, here in a couple of days. And, you know, if I worked at a nine to five job, I couldn't do that. But I can yeah. I can literally pick a day that I want to go and we can just say, you know what? Let's just take the kids. Let's just, I need to take a break. I need, I need to unplug for a little bit, spend a little time with the family. Let's go have a little fun. And we just do that. Yeah. And, and I think that's the main thing. It, it, to me, it affords me time, which is what I love most about this is flexibility and time. Now, that doesn't, I don't want to paint a rosy picture to say that, 
that's it. You know, as an entrepreneur, it's just, it's all, you get nothing. You can do whatever you want. No, you got to work your, I mean, you still got to work your rear end off. Yeah. Um, but you can work your rear end off at the hours that you want yeah. and you get to pick and choose how you, how you set up your time. Yeah. Um, well, and you get to pick and choose what you do, right? Cause for yeah. you and Russell, the, the big, the beginner internet podcast is a really key promotional thing for you. And if you hated podcasting, you probably would be doing something different. Absolutely. Yeah. Ab- yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, we would be doing something completely different yeah. and, um, you know, it gives us the opportunity to share some of the stuff that we know, and we've built uh, we've built a following on that podcast, and we get people that send in questions to it's it's so rewarding when we get people from uh, Australia and and uh, New Zealand and and uh, you know people over in the, in, in Wales, uh, yeah. you know, really all over the world. We've gotten emails from all over the world, people just sending us questions and saying thank you for your podcast. It's great. We love tuning into your show. You guys offer some great, uh, a lot of great tips on there. And to me, you know, I, I read something like that and it's just like, man, this reaffirms if I wasn't making a dime from this, I would be doing it because yeah. I enjoy doing that. I, I enjoy helping other people and making, um, you know, sharing what I know, you know, what, what I, if I can help, if I can share what I know with others that will help them, that to me, that's that's a lot of fun because um, I think you know it's, it goes back to that old uh, Zig Ziglar uh, quote: "If you help enough other people get yeah. what they want, you know it'll come back to you." Yeah, events. yeah. No, that's awesome. So, well, how how you mentioned you said you have two kids; they're seven and nine years old. Now, two things I'm really curious about, and, and the mm-hmm. first thing is based on the math I'm doing in my head. I'm thinking when you got laid off from your job and started your business, you had at least one small child, right? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So how, how on earth do you, do you have a small child to support and, and then go off and say, you know what, I'm going to give up my corporate, I'm going to give up my corporate income. Yeah. And and not only that too, uh, Jeff, at the time we just bought a new house. Oh, wow. (laughs) So let's even, even, even harder. (laughs) Yeah. Even more pressure. Yeah. Yeah. We had just moved into a a new house about the time that I got laid off. And you're right. My, um, my, uh, my seven year old at that time was, uh, was what two, I guess around two. Uh, so that was, that was crazy times, you know, it was a lot of stuff going on during that time. And, um, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, I had to realize, you know, whatever I did, if I go back to the rate, if I go back and if I get a nine to five job or if I get a, a, a corporate job where there's uh, all of this pressure, y- you can go that route. But there's no there's to me, there's no there's no such thing as security. I, I mm-hmm. that totally changed my mentality. You know, I, I was pretty much changing my mindset during that time anyway. But mm. it just reconfirmed that there's no such thing as security in this world. Security is your ability to get out there and to produce. And <clears throat> if you're going to rely, <clears throat> if you're counting on a job, a job out there as your security, I think that you're more in danger than someone who's out there just doing it on their own because uh, it's like I say, if I have multiple clients, I'm, <laughs> it's like having multiple employers more, yeah. more, so, you know, because, you know, when you've got, when you work for a company, you've got one single client mm-hmm. and that's yep, exactly. <laughs> more or less exactly. and that you're hanging on to that one single client. That's yeah. to me, that's, that's not security at no, all. No. And, and, and you know what, what fascinates me to no end, and I went through that exact same mental shift, is there are so many people that keep working their corporate jobs because they <clears> feel <throat> as though they need the security yeah. that comes from that job. But then as soon as people quit their mm-hmm. corporate job, for, for whatever reason, their mindset completely changes, and they feel like, right. oh, my gosh, I am so much more secure now yeah. than yeah. I was in that single client, quote, unquote, situation. Absolutely. Yeah, because you got them. It's like the multi going back to the multiple streams of income. You got how cool is it to have uh, streams of income? You know, coming in from, you know, I have streams of income coming in not only from my clients but also from my uh, my online podcast and my uh, my business and and uh, you know we do training webinars and things like that and and all kinds of cool stuff that we can get and sell digital products and things like that today. Mm-hmm. One of the things I worked on today was a, a digital. Uh, product, a digital audio product that, uh, you know, it's that this is fun stuff. You know, it's like, yeah. that's what I spent most of my day doing today is creating 
a, uh, a new audio report um, uh, for clients. And, um, you know, stuff like this is, is a lot of fun, but, you know, it goes back to, it's just like you said, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not tied to one entity anymore. Yeah. Um, I can, I can know, uh, good and well, if, if, if I have a client that no longer uses my services, then, you know, guess what? That's okay. I'm not, uh, yeah. I'm not crippled. Yeah. Just, just once it's just one, it's just one little thing. Right. Exactly. And, and there's more, <clears throat> well, John, you know, we talked about, uh, you have a seven and a nine year old. Mm -hmm. What do you think their life is going to look like, and how is that different than if you had stayed in the corporate world? Well, I tell you what, I have more time. One of the one of the uh, great things is I have more time to be around them. Mm -hmm. Now, it, uh, my office, I have an office here in my home, and mm -hmm. and um, that doesn't always mean that um, I get a lot of privacy because uh. my even <laughs> even when the door shut. Uh, my kids will sometimes, and they know usually when uh, dad's got the door shut, that, that means that he doesn't need to be disturbed. But occasionally uh -huh. I'll hear a little knock on the door. Uh -huh. And, uh, and sometimes if I'm not, uh, if I'm not on a podcast or if I'm not on a phone conference, I'm okay with, uh, you know, letting them come in and chat. And, you know, yeah. it's just that, that flexibility of saying, you know, you can come in and, and one of the things that we do, Jeff, we actually homeschool. So my kids oh, are cool. around me all of the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> And, you know, I, uh, I'm a big proponent of, of teaching, um, you know, they get, my wife uh, grew up homeschooled and, and she does a lot of their education, but on my end, I actually, uh, I, I'm kind of one of those out of the box thinkers. So awesome. I like to teach them, listen, uh, I'm, I don't want you guys settling, uh, thinking in terms of a nine to five job or anything mm -hmm. like that. You know, when there's stuff to be done, I say, well, Here's a great way you can do that. In fact, um, you'll think this is funny because we talked about this earlier, and I was, I'm glad you asked this question because uh -huh. my, uh, my kids, um, they, um, they happen to be on a uh, – my wife happens to be on a gluten-free diet, and she had mm. them tested, and they're kind of, they have some of the same sensitivities. So, mm. you know, you could uh, lament the fact that my kids uh, – you know, the, your kids are like, oh, they have to – they can't eat gluten or anything like that, but – I told them, I said, you know what, why don't you guys have fun with this and get a video camera out and start creating your own um, little video show for, um, you know, for doing, uh, you know, how, you know, gluten free recipes for kids, you know, make it fun wow. and do and do stuff like that. And so they uh, they started doing uh, their own little video show, and even though they're not quite old enough to um uh, to, to, uh, upload videos to YouTube yet, but they can, you know, they can create videos. I want them to get in the process of, of learning how to create content. And I say, you yeah. know, create your show. And so that they actually start doing all sorts of, uh, video, they get out the video camera and they will do a, um, you know, in, in one of their school lessons, they're learning about weather, you know? So I okay. told them, I said, uh, create some videos about weather, you know, so they actually did, they actually, uh, dressed up and, and, uh, uh got like a weatherman, uh, <laughs> put on the weatherman's, uh, outfit and, and started yeah. putting up like a globe and, and started teaching about, uh, and got a, actually got a whiteboard up and started showing about how, uh, fronts are, you know, the cold front moves in and they started teaching all this stuff. And, and to me, you know, teaching is a great way to learn. So, yeah. Um, so when they can get up there and teach, uh, on video, I think that that's just reinforcing everything and, you know, just teaching them, uh, I, I show them how to edit stuff for me. Like in my, you know, I don't, I don't give them all of the, the big stuff, but uh -huh. I do when I've got some editing work, I teach my kids, especially my nine year old, the oldest, how to get down and how to edit a uh, video or oh, a, that's awesome. an audio. Yeah. Yeah. So he can, uh, he's learning to do. Um, you know, learning technology. He's learning to do some things. And, and if he does an editing job for me, a simple editing job, I'll pay him. Uh, I'll actually pay him for that. So he's, um, cool. you know, we're not on salary around here. We're on, <laughs> our kids are on commission. So, yeah, that's, that's awesome. I was, I was, how, well, I was going to ask you how much interest do they show in what you do? Um, you know, the, uh, the oldest, which is nice, he's a very creative, mm -hmm. he has a very creative mindset and he's very, he likes what I do, okay. um, cause he's kind of, uh, he's much like his dad is very, mm -hmm. uh, creative and likes, um, uh, he likes a lot of digital game. He likes a lot of games and so he likes to play games. 
uh, a lot of things like that online. I have to I have to keep up with what he's into, but yeah. Um, but he's also big on he loves to create. He loves to create uh, video. You know, just okay. like I was saying, he loves to create um, video shows. I mean, he loves to get in front of the camera and create uh, video shows and send them out to his grandparents. You know, send them off to his grandparents so they can watch and anybody else that'll watch. That is so. Um, cool. And so he loves to, uh, he's got that creative side that loves to put stuff like that together. And I think that that's going to be his, he's going to be geared towards my mindset. My youngest is more kind of, he likes to see how things work. He's kind of got that uh, um, engineering mindset where he likes to kind of reverse engineer things. But, hey, I think that's a great, uh, that's a great uh, (laughs) personality. We need lots of different people in this world. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And I teach him, I said, you know what, listen, guys, you don't have to, you know, one of the things I emphasize to is you don't have to go, you know, I'm not, I'm never going to pressure them to go the traditional route of mm. like dad did and go four years of school, unless you know exactly what you want. You mm. know, there are sure. things that you can learn uh, if they want to go to college, that's great. But if they want to get, if they want to get some, uh, you know, a technical degree, technical degree, if they want to become entrepreneurs, mm. I want to encourage them to do their own thing. And um, and not rely on uh, a four year degree, because in my lesson, you know, I teach them, you know, listen, guys, I'm not doing anything uh, in terms of what I went to school for in college. Yeah. So, yeah, and, uh, you, know, you know, one of the things that I like to ask folks is how and I think you already answered it, but how much of what you learned in college do you use on a day to day basis? <laughs> I tell you, I abs- if I wish I could name one thing just to say I've got <laughs> some kind of value, some kind of financial value, but honestly, I, I, I really can't. And it's really sad. I think it's a sad state of, uh, of education, of, uh, of a college education to say that uh, I really can't take anything of value other than the fact, you know, if I had gone into the degree that I worked in uh, or that I was going to school for at the time, there would have been some, obviously some value there. I would have mm-hmm. learned some things towards that. But given the fact that I didn't end up going into that field of study, I can't say that I learned a whole lot of I, I didn't take anything of, uh, of value away other than the fact that uh, maybe, you know, getting some. Uh, a little bit of discipline as, as far as, you know, uh, you know, establishing that discipline in, you know, getting up, going to classes and, and yeah. preparing for, for tests and things like that. But even that, I wasn't super disciplined in yeah. that. And, well, and you certainly probably could have gotten that much cheaper somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. 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 I think, I think, um, you know, at that time, uh, 30, $40,000, I mean, that's for an in-state school too. And, yeah. and, uh, I, I just, you know, I, I tell if if you ask me if I would have done that all, if I what I would have done if I had that to do all over again, I would take uh, easy. My easy answer would be I'd take that forty thousand dollars and would have used yep. that to uh, jumpstart a company uh, early on. Yeah, yeah. I don't hesitate in that because I just, you know, I I just and le- I you know and that doesn't. I'm not. I'm not a. Uh, I'm not bashing anyone that wants to go. I think if you've got a legitimate reason or if you've got something specifically in mind, but I am totally against going to a, um, going to school if you don't know what you're going to do. Yeah. I think it's just a waste these days. Yeah. It's, it's going to be so exciting to see when people uh, of your kids' generation grow up because I think we have more and more people now who are looking at college from mm-hmm. a much more realistic standpoint. Right. And there's so many more, there's uh, more, I think as they get older too, and, and, uh, uh, more kids today, as they get older, there's so there's going to be more and more online opportunities and online options to get your degree without spending a fortune online. You'll be able to, um, you know, I think of, uh, I want to, I'm a huge fan of, uh, um, the Khan Academy that's on YouTube where you can literally get on and I mean, get. It's just all kinds of education for free from a guy that teaches kids, helps kids how to, um, you know, through algebra, through ge- uh, geometry, calculus, you name it. I mean, yeah. the, the guy's just got uh, uh, just a library of uh, enormous library full of videos that, that shows kids, that helps kids, you know, that are ha- maybe having math problems. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think you're going to see more options like that for universities, mm-hmm. more online university options over um, as time goes. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, Jonathan, I want to ask you real quick. 
because we probably have a lot of listeners out here who are trying to grow an audience and grow a platform around something. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. and what are some of the key lessons that you learned and some of the key pieces of advice that you would have to someone who's trying to grow an Mm -hmm. online show or a podcast? I tell you, my biggest thing would be to niche. If possible, niche Mm -hmm. as much as you can. Um, People sometimes are afraid to get real specific in what they... Uh, what they focus in on. And I'll tell you from experience, because <clears throat> our show could be, our, we have a large audience, but our show could be a lot bigger if we were more, uh, we have a broad, I mean, we're in a broad market, which is... Um, and a competitive one. Yeah, and a very competitive yeah. one, an online market. And I'll say the only thing that's helped us grow is, is our consistency. Mm-hmm. We do, I mean, we do a show week in and week out, and that's helped us because a lot of guys that do these shows, even in the online marketing, they'll do it here and there and... Mm-hmm. and We've just made a commitment to say, no matter what, rain or shine, guest or no guest, we're going to have a, we're going to have a, we're going to re- be recording a show this week, um, and we'll get some content out there, and we'll answer some questions and and uh, share some thoughts. But I would say that um, that if you're if you want to tackle podcasting, I think it is an awesome way to create an online business. Uh, I just think that uh, if you can pick a niche, if you can really pick something that. Um, that you really enjoy something that you're focused in on. And mm-hmm. it doesn't even have to be business related. It could be, mm-hmm. uh, it could be a podcast about, um, some TV show or some movie that you're mm-hmm. a big fan of. I mean, that you could create a, um, a brand around. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think of, uh, uh, there are tons of podcasts out there that focus on, uh, some movies, you know, some of the latest movies mm-hmm. and things discuss, you know, especially if it's one of these, uh, movies that, you know, it's an ongoing, uh, type series of uh, of movies to come, you know, mm. you can really create a huge platform out of that, and then leverage a lot of those listeners into other shows that you do. But um, but that would be the biggest. I, I think of all things, I would recommend at the top of the list is just have you know be focused on a niche. Um, don't be afraid to get narrow because you're going to find that. Um, there's a lot of people out there yeah, <laughs> and there's yeah. a lot of fans of what you like. So, well, and, um, and you said something really interesting. You said you have a, a, a very large following on the beginner internet podcast, but you said mm-hmm. that you think it would be larger had you niched more. Yes, I, I absolutely believe that. I think that, uh, if you're not, um, you know, we even tried to even, even, you know, even in our podcast, we kind of tried to, uh, to use that beginner internet business. Like, as uh, you know, to separate us from not mm, mm-hmm. just being an internet business podcast, yeah. but this one's for beginners who are getting started with online marketing. Yeah. But uh, but even that, you know, we are still um, because of the categories that we qualify for on iTunes and things like that. It's 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 really we're just lumped in there with a lot of other marketers. And I think right now we're like in the top 30 of uh, podcasts for, for internet business podcasts and things like that. So, oh, cool. I mean, they, you can, and, and there's a lot, there's a ton of them yeah. on iTunes that are listed on there. But, yeah. um, but I just think, I think that if you can, if you can narrow, if you can narrow your market onto something, you're going to find that you're, there's very little competition because mm-hmm. uh, the narrow you go, the, uh, the competition gets less and less and um, and you're going to find that people will find you. It'll be mm. very easy to rank online, especially uh, for keywords and things like that. If you're in a much narrower niche, and people mm. will find you and spread the word. So then, once you pick your niche, how do you get people to listen? Once you get started, uh, you've really got. There's going to be a period of time, and I just you know you you, you got to be uh, you know you got to tell people just how it is. Sometimes there's going to be a period of time where you're like. Really, is this working? Because you're not going to, uh, even if you launch a weekly episode, um, you're not going to see, you're not going to see success until um, you really start getting out consistently. And you've got to, I would say for everybody that does a podcast, please, by all means, give it at least a year, give it 12 months, Mm. Uh, commit to whatever you decide to do, commit to that one thing, to that podcast, or if you're going to launch a blog or whatever it is, commit to it for 12 months. And be consistent about it, and I promise you, if you commit to something like that for 12 months, you are going to see some great results. Um, but the problem with most people, and I'm going to say the problem, and be flat out honest, most people, the problem is that they get discouraged after after about four months mm. and say, you know what, <clears throat> I've really tried at this and it's really not working and I'm not seeing the results. Well, you're not going to in mm. four months. 
mm-hmm. really, I mean, we could have we could have easily given up when we first started our podcast uh, because our after about three or four months, our listenership was not very good. Mm-hmm. And, you know, something happened along the way after, you know, we hit that six month, things start changing. And I think that people have to see uh, people that are going to be become fans of your podcast. They going to look at you and they're going to see, is this is this person? Are they along to stay for the, I mean, are they here to stay? Are mm. they committed to this? And because there's so many people out there that start and stop. Mm. And so if you can just, if you can pick something and commit to it and be consistent about it. And when I mean consistency, that's a big, that's a big keyword with uh, Russell and myself is consistency is making sure that each week you're posting some content. Um, you know, if it's, uh, it doesn't have to be, You don't have to post a podcast, you know, three or four times a week. If you can do a show once a week and maybe make a blog post in addition to that, um, I think you're fine. You know, if you post more than that, you know, you're probably going to grow even faster. But Mm -hmm. but we've just got into the um, into the habit of posting at least at the very least one show per week that we get out there. And, um, we don't all, it's not always, uh, the same length of time. You know, sometimes we have a guest, it's a 90 minute show. Sometimes we don't have a guest, it's a 30 minute show. So, um, so it really, there's no set length. As long as you're getting content out there, people will, um, you know, people overlook a lot if they can see that you're consistent about something They you don't have to be perfect. Just be consistent. Cool. Cool. So you said something really interesting, which was, it's, it's not about the length. It's about the quality of the content. It's about the quality, and I tell you, consistency. I will say this: consistency sometimes trumps quality because mm. I, we have we've put put out some shows that um, that have not been the greatest shows, but mm. we get emails from people that say, you know, we really appreciate you guys' show because you guys get it out there each week, and um, and I know, and they don't say this, but I know <clears throat> some of our shows. I just sometimes think, man, that was just not worth. Uh, putting out mm-hmm. there and um, or the audio quality, you know, we've had an interview, you know, we've had some interviews in the past where the audio quality, the, some, for some reasons, the Skype quality was just, it just turned out terrible. Yeah. And we don't know what happened. I don't know if it was on, sometimes it's been on a, um, we've had people that are, um, some, <laughs> some of our guests have showed up on the call and they didn't have headphones and there's, you know, mm-hmm. or microphones or anything like that and they're just yeah. speaking at their computer and it sounds yeah. like they're a big, um, trash can uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like they're in this big 55 gallon drum and it's yeah. like oh man this is so awful you know but um but you know we clean it up as much as we can and get it out there and um you know i think that you know you want to strive for awesome quality you want to get good stuff you want to create good content that people will enjoy but you're not going to knock it out you know you're never going to bat a thousand mm-hmm. um baseball you you know you're batting you've got a great <laughs> average if you're batting about three 300 275 is pretty good you know okay. so uh, so take that analogy you don't have to but you have to be consistent you have to get uh, get up to the plate every time and at least swing and uh and try and get get some content out each week but it doesn't have to be perfect and that's i think that's a fatal flaw that most people they they want things to be just right and they want things to be so perfect that they don't do anything and you yeah. know that's kill so many people is that this perfectionism of trying to get things just right um and uh you know guy uh, i've uh, i've been an understudy of dan kennedy uh a marketer he's He's just a brilliant marketer and he's like you know what if it's good enough it's good enough get it out there Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect get your get your content out there get your stuff out there to people um, because they're going to overlook a lot if you give, you know, if you give good content, it ha- doesn't have to be perfect. Definitely, definitely, great, great advice. And that's not just for for podcasting; that's for everything you do. Oh, for yeah, yeah. So, Jonathan, what is the biggest piece of advice or the biggest thing you would want to say to somebody who wants to create a lifestyle business like you have? I would say, um, you know, be prepared to. Um, you know, it's not all rosy, uh, and especially when you're first getting started, um, you're going to have to put in some hours. You know, it's kind of like I think of the, um, you know, the rocket ship analogy where uh, most of the fuel on a on a rocket when when the uh, space shuttle is going in and out of space, most of the fuels burn up when just getting off the ground. Mm-hmm. You know, and so once you get into the, the uh, once you get in the outer orbit, uh, you can. I mean, you don't need that much fuel at all to. Yeah. Uh, once you get past, uh, once you pull away from the gravity, but you have to burn up a whole lot of fuel 
just to get off. And it's like that when you're starting a business too. So um, I don't want to paint a I don't want to paint a picture that says um, you make the switch and it's all going to be great. You're going to have to work. Um, you know, you got to put in some hours when you first get started to make that life, to make that change. But I'm going to tell you, it's worth every waking hour at night. It's worth, you know, when you're sleeping, um, you know, there have been many, many nights when uh, my wife and kids are, are, you know, sleeping in bed and they're uh, tucked away in bed and I'm up till two or three in the morning working on a project, you yeah. know. Um, yeah. That's that's not uncommon. And uh, but, you know, I love I, I, you know, it's it's going back to that flexibility. I love I can do, you know, knowing that I can work on things when I want to work on them is great. But I think the lesson is to not be discouraged in the early um, early on when you're first getting started out. But to understand you've got to put some work into anything to get off the ground. But uh, once you do, once you put in that effort at, oh, after so long, you can kind of let off the gas. It's um I'll give you a great example is not only our podcast, but, um, you know, we've had uh, one of our guests that we had on, on our show recently who had uh, created a YouTube channel. Mm. And his first year, he had launched like 250 videos on YouTube. Mm. And, uh, I mean, just put out a massive amount of video in his first year of getting off the ground. Um, but his second year, what's interesting, after, after one year of putting out 250 videos, he had a million views and about 12,000 subscribers, which is pretty good. That's quite respectable. Yeah, that's very good. And, um, but I'll tell you something that interesting happened because I had a follow-up interview with him a year later. And his second year, you know, he did 250 videos his first year on YouTube. His second year, he only did 30. 30 oh, wow. Videos. That was it. So he... He scaled down quite a bit. But what was interesting, Jeff, that happened was even though he only did 30 videos in his second year, his second year, he went from a million views to four million views and from uh, 12,000 subscribers up to 40,000 subscribers. Oh, wow. Wow. And so he, even though he scaled back, even though he let his foot off the gas that first year, that's why it's so important to put in that, you know, like the rocket ship, put in all that energy in the first year. Because in the second year, he was able to let off, keep, you know, let his foot off the gas, and he was able to coast a little. And even though he didn't uh, post near as many videos as he did the first year, the phenomenal thing is his traffic tripled. And, I mean, his, <laughs> his views amazing. tripled. That is amazing. So um, that's just a lesson, you know, just how that works, you know, that, that initial... Uh, drive when you're first getting started, and if you if you really put your time and effort in that first year, um, that's why I tell you know I tell everybody you know if you're going to start something, you got to commit to it for 12 months and commit really hard to it and work work it you know really hard for 12 months, and I promise you I don't I, I there's rarely you're going to not see success if you really commit to something uh, for a year and really put your best effort into it. That is that's one of the most awesome pieces of advice that we've ever gotten on this show. That's that's amazing. Thank Thanks. you very much for that insight. Yeah. That is hugely hugely valuable because that's what everybody on this show wants to know about is how can I, you know, how can I get to that point where I can let my foot off the gas. Yep. Well, Jonathan, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. You have brought a lot of insight and a lot of experience and a lot of great stuff to our listeners. Absolutely. I know. Well, I thank you, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And where can we go to get more information about you? Well, you can, uh, you can visit us. Uh, our podcast is bibpodcast.com. There you can find our weekly podcast. And we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, uh, we try to get out a show. And then I try to at least post a uh, midweek, um, uh, usually a midweek blog post on there. And then uh, so we've got a lot of content. I think we're up to about 243 episodes on that website. So wow. if, you, um, if you go to that site, there's a lot, a lot of content. And Excellent. you can do uh, a search for all sorts of different things. That's our podcast site. And then, of course, um, we have uh, Russell and myself. We have a, a company over at Buzz Mountain Media and Marketing, uh, Digital Marketing and Media, exec, um, excuse me. But that's over at buzzmountain.com, and that is our local uh, marketing company. And um, that's uh, two places where you can find us. Excellent. Well, we'll link those up below the show. And I thank you so much for being here and uh, look forward to staying in touch. And best of luck with everything. Thanks, Jeff. I enjoyed it so much. As always, love to, uh, love to do it again sometime. Definitely. This was probably one of the most jam-packed with information episodes of this show that we've ever had. I want to emphasize the really, really important thing that Jonathan taught us on today's show, and that is that 
it's less about quality and more about consistency. This is something that I've seen time and time again in my business, and I've struggled with it in my business. And many of the guests on the show have said it's about consistency, 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 consistently creating that content day after day, week after week, as Jonathan and Russell have done on the Beginner and Internet podcast. So if you would do me a favor, if you're on the website, please scroll down and leave a comment for me and let me know what do you think of the show? What did you like about it? What did you not like about it? Also, if you're in iTunes, leave a rating. You can leave a rating between one and five stars, and I'd love to hear what you think, and I'd love for everyone else on iTunes to know what you think. So until next time. Thanks for joining us on the How to Quit Working Show. Tune in next time when we'll talk to another amazing person just like you who is now living the ultimate life of freedom and doing it on their terms. If you want to learn how to quit working and get these episodes delivered directly to you, visit howtoquitworkingshow.com.